Okay, so we're continuing through Unit 6 of Humble Yourself, The Way to Greatness. And Unit 6 is Humble Yourself Before Man, the lowest place. And we're up to point F, which is not to condemn, but to save. You consider Jesus, God in the flesh, knowing all things and walking with humans. And we even have from the gospel accounts some pretty ridiculous things that the disciples said while they were walking with him before they had the Holy Spirit when they really didn't understand what was going on. And Jesus, though, yes, he did sometimes rebuke them and sometimes even harshly, but Jesus was still always loving to them. His mission was not to condemn, but to save. He had compassion on them. Even a rebuke from Jesus is compassion. Even a rebuke from Jesus. Remember, we talked about prophets and receiving prophets um, in a, a prior segment. But remember, Jesus is the prophet like Moses, who God has ordained to speak for him. That's one of the roles as the Messiah that he fulfills. So Jesus, a rebuke from Jesus, Jesus telling you to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is the most loving thing he could possibly ever say to you. He came to save you, not to condemn. He said, I don't come to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. And there's more on this. I don't want to go on too long of a tangent, but I encourage you to listen to the course, the podcast course, and it's also available on the website. Uh, and we have USB drives and a download and the whole thing. You can get the whole course. But the gospel is the power. Goes into Jesus and his heart, not to condemn, but to save. Not to judge, but to save. The world is already subject to and heading for the wrath of God. The world has already been turned over to their own evil desire. But God, by sending his son, loved the world so much that he made a way of salvation, that if people would turn to Jesus Christ, look unto him, believe in him, receive the Holy Spirit, walk with him, repent of their sins, do things God's way instead of their own way, that they will receive eternal life and dwell with God forever according to God's original plan for mankind. So look at the gospel is the power. We go on a lot in a lot of detail about God's eternal redemptive plan and how Jesus came to set us free, not to condemn us, not to judge us, but to save us and set us free even from ourselves. And so for the sake of this, not to condemn, but to save, point one here is don't judge. Don't judge. You're not the judge. Stop judging other people. You're like a judgment machine. and you. But judging others is one of the ways that you are exalting yourself over them. You think you're better than them, you're looking down on them. You're picking them. You're picking on them. You're giving them nicknames, rude nicknames to go with their personality traits that stand out to you that, you know, causes them. So oftentimes these nicknames are make them less than human, even in your sight, or it's a mocking or a ridiculing nickname that you give them. You're judging them. You are exalting yourself over them. This unit is called Humble yourself before man, the lowest place, not exalting yourself over others as if you are the judge rather than Jesus being the judge. Well, here's something that Jesus has to say about that. Matthew 7, starting with verse 1, judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take a speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first 
Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So I'm not going to go on too extensively talking about the difference between a speck and a log. I think you got that. You don't need to tell me to tell you that a speck is a tiny piece and a log is a big, like, lumberjack tree sticking out of your eye, okay? You got the point. Jesus' words are pretty clear there. The thing is that while you still have a log in your eye, you cannot see clearly. And so with this log in your eye, you're making all these judgments about other people that are to condemn them, but not to save them. But here's the thing. As Jesus comes into your life, as the Holy Spirit begins to convict you of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, as that transformation regeneration process begins in your own life, you start to see that everything you've been doing is wrong and that you deserve the judgment of God. But God doesn't come to condemn you. No, he comes to show you his way and how to do things his way way. So as you go through the process of taking the log out of your eye, you become someone who understands how to help someone who also has a log or even just a speck in their eye. When you still have a log in your eye, you don't know what the root of the problem really is because you haven't dealt with it in your own heart yet. But once God has dealt with you in any given particular area, then you can see clearly to be helpful, to be useful for helping someone else remove what they have in their eye that is distorting their vision and causing them difficulty and challenges. What I've discovered about this is that I I meet people who might be very kind on the surface and they're more like the peacekeeper personality, but sometimes these people under the surface, they're very nice on the surface, but under the surface, they are harshly and deeply critical and judgmental. And oftentimes they don't have discernment. They lack discernment. They lack true spiritual discernment. Why? Because they are so busy with their peacekeeping personality and the way that they like to keep peace between people, but they also use the same thing in God's process with them. They're so busy convincing themselves all the time, well, I'm okay, and it's okay, and God has me right where he wants me, and it's okay. And, you know, it's like they're they're legitimizing themselves, and they're using the love of God to as a free pass for them not engaging with the Holy Spirit to take the planks out out of their eyes. It's like, I have this gigantic plank in my right eye, and the plank in my left eye is even bigger. But Jesus died on a cross, so I'm okay with God. It's okay. I'm at peace. I have the, I have a peace. I'm at peace. These planks in my eyes, they don't bother me at all. I'm okay. It's okay. God knows about these planks. And it's like, um, no, you're missing it. God wants you to take the planks out of your eyes by allowing him to engage with you and show you the areas in your life where you're not okay. Because guess what? You're not okay. So here's why Jesus died on a cross. He died so, yes, the forgiveness, the mercy from him is already there. It was paid for 2,000 years ago on the cross by the shed blood of Jesus. So, yes, it is okay for you to confess all the ways that you are not okay. So go ahead and get on with the transformation process. Stop letting yourself off of the hook because of the blood of Jesus and instead dive into the blood of Jesus like the safety net revealing, you know, just it's safe to confess all your sins, reveal all your junk because the blood of Jesus has already covered it all. So you can be honest with yourself and with others and repent of the ways that you're not okay and that you're not doing things God's way. Because here's where it the rubber hits the road. And I've seen this in many people's lives. I've had to say this to several people along the way. 
The reason you don't have discernment, spiritual discernment, is because you have not taken the planks out of your own eyes yet. I don't care if you've been a believer for 20, 30, 40 years. If you have not allowed God to deal with the planks in your eyes, you are not going to be able to see clearly to help anyone else take the speck out of theirs. And you won't be very compassionate. You might be able to put on a nice facade, the kindness facade, on the outside. Oh, yes, I'm a peacekeeper. Oh, it's okay. I'll go with the way you want to do things. But then you get in the car or you go home and you're cussing them out the whole way and you're judging everything they did as you depart from them. That is not the love of God. And and your act of kindness on the surface is actually hypocrisy. That's what Jesus said. You hypocrite. You're an actor. A hypocrite is an actor, like George Clooney is an actor. Hypocrite means actor in Greek. You hypocrite, because you're putting on a show. Do-do-do, look at my performance. I'm putting on the show like I'm actually a really nice person. But then as you depart from them, you're judging them, cussing them out, and, and exalting yourself over them the whole time. So this is a problem. We've got to stop judging others. First, let yourself be subject to God's process in your life. Then you don't get authority to judge, but you will grow in discernment because you'll be able to see clearly. Now, here, just a quick side note on this. When you've got a plank in your eye, usually if you are offended by someone else's behavior, that is usually a sign that you still have a plank in your eye on that very issue that you are so offended about. And you say, well, no, I don't do that. I, okay, but here's how you got to do it. Instead of maybe the outward form of the behavior that's offending you so much, look at the root of it. So maybe it's pride. Well, they're functioning in arrogance and pride. Well, guess what? If their arrogance and pride is offending you, it's because you still have arrogance and pride. Or let me put it to you this way. The first time that I ever really got this, it was like my aha moment, if you will, the light bulb went off, is I was I spent some time with someone. And then as I was driving away, I said to the Lord, oh, Lord, they just talked about themselves the whole time. How rude. And the Lord said to me, yeah, but the only reason that you're offended by that is because you wanted to talk about yourself. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. Do you see how it works? Like, oh, oh, I get it. Okay. So maybe I wouldn't have talked about myself the same way that they did. But yeah, the core root is still the same. So I got to take that plank out of my eye. And then it won't be offensive to me when somebody else has the same speck in their eye. And so you've got to ask the Lord. So something's offending you. Ask the Lord, what is it about that, what they're doing that is so offensive to me? And the the Lord can answer you. He's a steward with words. He'll say it in one word, two words. He'll, he will reveal it to you if you will ask him to. And it will be something I guarantee that you are still dealing with in your own heart, in your own spiritual walk. So because if you had already dealt with it, If you never dealt with the problem, then it would be easy for you to have sympathy for it because it's something that you don't fully comprehend or understand, but it's not your personal struggle. But if it's something that you have already dealt with and you've put it to the cross and you've taken the plank out of your eye, then you don't have judgment for the person anymore. You have useful sympathy useful sympathy, not fleshly, carnal, making everybody feel okay about themselves when they're not sympathy, but you have useful sympathy to help someone else overcome the same problem that the Lord has helped you overcome. So judge not. Judgment is not what Jesus came to do, and he did not send us out to judge He sent us out to proclaim the way that God has made for everyone to be saved and to be transformed by him into his glory, not by judgment, but by love.
So we also have to keep in mind that God has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of condemnation, but the ministry of reconciliation, God reconciling, bringing people back into right standing with him, right relationship with him. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Do you get that? This is the ministry of reconciliation, not that we judge people for their trespasses, but we don't count people's trespasses against them. Why? Because Jesus has shed his blood on a cross to wipe their trespasses away, just like he wiped your trespasses away and continues to do so every day when you sin, when you mess up, when you trespass, when you err against him. They have the same mercy from God available to them that you do. So the ministry of reconciliation is not counting people's trespasses against them. You know, um, judgmentalism is not a fruit of the Spirit. Criticism is not a fruit of the Spirit. Love is not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So there you have it. And I'd encourage you to look at 2 Corinthians 5 in your own time. Paul goes on and on in the contrast of the old covenant law, which is the ministry of condemnation, and the new covenant law, which is the ministry of uh, reconciliation. And also it's a glorious, it's glorious how we can be beholding Jesus and transformed into his glory. But we need to remember that God has given us good news. It's good news. It's good news. The world is already condemned to hell, but we don't go around proclaiming bad news of you're going to hell, you're going to hell. No, it's good news. You're going to hell, but God has made a way for you not to go, right? So we've got to proclaim the good news that God has made a way of escape. For, for all people to be saved if they will place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But condemning others, again, is the equivalent to exalting ourselves above them. As if that person that you're judging were not just as desperately in need of a Savior as you are. So don't judge. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation not the ministry of condemnation. So don't exalt yourself over others by condemning them or judging them. So we're also going to look at the law of liberty. Liberty. So these passages will start in James chapter 1, but then we also will jump into James chapter 2. Now, remember, when the, the letter that James wrote was written, when he wrote this letter, it didn't have chapters and verses and demarcations and, you know, all these different lines and, and separations of the text. So James is writing it as one letter. Now, yes, he moves from subject to subject, but it is one letter. So we're just going to take that in context that we're jumping from James 1, 25, and then forward a few verses to James 2, verse 8. But let's take a look at what he says, and then we'll explain a little bit about what he means. So, uh, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now we go on. If you really fulfill the royal law, so pause, the, the law we talked about just a moment ago was the law of liberty, the perfect law, the law of liberty. But now he's talking about a different law, 
the the royal law according to the scriptures. Now remember, in the new Co- the New Testament didn't exist yet. The New Testament had not yet been assembled. All of these letters that people are writing to believers to encourage them in their faith. When someone talks about the scripture, they're talking about scripture that already existed. He's not talking about what the Apostle Paul has taught as the law of Christ. He, that letter wasn't even written yet. Right. So when James talks about the royal law, according to Scripture, he's talking about the law of Moses. When he's talking about the perfect law, the law of liberty, he's talking about the law of Christ who liberated us from the law of sin and death. So he's talking in the same way that Paul does, especially if you want to go into Romans chapter eight. But James is using his own language. He's using his own language to say the same thing. Paul called the Old Testament law the law of sin and death. Why? Because no one has ever been able to fulfill it. And therefore, all people are subject to the curse and death under that Old Covenant law, right? But the law of liberty is that Jesus Christ set us free from that Old Covenant law, according to the Scripture, so that we are free from its obligations, so that we can live by faith freely for the Lord. So let me keep going. So if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which that's how the old covenant law is summarized. um, You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, now he's still talking about the old covenant law of Moses, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So those are two of the uh, Ten Commandments, right? So he's definitely talking the royal law is the law of Moses. He goes on, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor under the law or of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, We're not going to be judged under the old covenant law. We're not going to be judged by the Ten Commandments. God has not nullified the Ten Commandments, but that's the old covenant. We are in the new covenant. We are no longer under the royal law. We will be judged under the law of liberty. The law of liberty is that Jesus Christ set us free and showed us mercy that we did not deserve. What we deserved was death under the law, death by the old covenant standard, death because no one has ever been able to fulfill the requirement of the royal law. But we have been set free by the mercy of God. So speak and act as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty which in one, verse 125, he said, the perfect law, the law of liberty, we're going to be judged under the perfect law, the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So the perfect law is God's heart of mercy. Mercy. So what's coming to mind even in this moment with Jesus telling these parables, but Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, by law, a rebellious son who refused to obey his father, by law, that father should have taken the rebellious son to the elders of the city and should have had his son stoned to death. But the father loved his son so much that he showed the son mercy. Let him go on his way. And then when he came back, the father didn't go with him. The father didn't go and, you know, sleep with prostitutes and sleep with the pigs, you know, and eat the the food of the pigs with him. The father waited patiently for the son to come back. And when the son came back, the father showed mercy 
mercy. He didn't take him to the elders of the city and have him stoned to death according to the law. He showed him mercy. That's the perfect law. That's the heart of God. Mercy. Mercy. And Pharisees listening to Jesus tell this parable were horribly offended at it because they that they knew, okay, well, no, we're not supposed to show mercy. And so Jesus talked about that with the parable. In, in that same parable, the elder brother was so offended. You know, how can you give him this reward? You're, you're slaughtering the fattened calf for him. I've kept your rules this whole time. Because they were still looking at things through the royal law, the old covenant standard, but not the perfect law, the law of liberty and mercy, freedom from your offenses, freedom from your sins, freedom from your trespasses, freedom from the judgment that is right against you, freedom standing before the judge and him saying, you are pardoned. Yes, you've done all these things wrong, but you are pardoned. We, as followers of Christ, are called to live by the perfect law, not just that we have been fully pardoned, which we've got to walk in that reality, no doubt, walking in the reality of that we have been cleansed of our sins and totally forgiven. It is a life-changing thing to totally, fully understand and comprehend that Jesus Christ has completely paid for my sin so I can walk free with no condemnation and shame over all the things I've done in the past. But if I really understand what Jesus has done for me by setting me free— then I will turn around and show the same mercy to others who need to be set free, just like I needed to be set free. Do you see it, friends? There's a difference between the law of Christ, the perfect one, the perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of the one who liberates us He came and he showed mercy. That is our plumb line. That is our example. But if you will not show mercy, then no mercy will be shown to you. Judgment will be without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And again, Matthew 18, another parable of the unforgiving servant, the servant who was forgiven 20 years worth of wages, turned around and demanded the repayment of a debt of two days worth of wages. They clearly didn't understand the mercy that had just been shown them. And so what Jesus said is that they would be turned over to the jailers, to the tormentors, until they could pay in full the 20 years worth of wages that it is that they originally owned to the king. Judgment will be without mercy if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Judgment will be without mercy if you show no mercy to your fellow man. James in this context is talking about being kind to the poor, having works and deeds that correspond with the faith that you say you have. If you say you have faith, but you have things that someone else needs and you don't give them over, your faith is useless. It is pointless. It is your own puffed up imagination of what you think faith is. It is a mental ascent without heart transformation. It's not faith at all. It's dead, is what James says. So we've got to live as ones who have been liberated by the law of liberty and who show so much mercy to others that they are also liberated by the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. 